Hello there. As a three decade long journalist and broadcaster, anybody who knows me knows I get increasingly frustrated for what passes for journalism these days, which is why I decided to do my Gatekeeper series. Now, the whole point about the Gatekeeper series was to look at the media personalities who uh, who are operating as gatekeepers. The first one I did was broadcaster Jeremy Vine. The second one was Mariana Spring, the BBC's disinformation correspondent. And my focus today is Piers Morgan, arguably one of the most unpopular journalists in the UK. So first of all, what is a media gatekeeper? Well, a media gatekeeper's job is to ensure that specific topics are discussed while others are ignored. They also set perspectives and tone on how they want people to view a particular subject. So let us look at today's gatekeeper, Piers Morgan. He is an English journalist and broadcaster. His approach is rage and fury. He's a shock jock. Um, whichever subject he fixes his gaze on is all through the lens of outrage. He's an angry man raging at the world, incense. And, you know, the thing is about that is it all becomes a bit meaningless after a while. He leaps on bandwagons. He flogs books on the back of those bandwagons. So, first of all, some history. He was born in Sussex in 1965. His full name is Piers Stephen Pugh Morgan. Before journalism, Morgan worked at Lloyd's of London and he joined the Surrey and South London newspaper group in 1985. Now, this is when I first met him. I worked for the London newspaper group, which was a series of local newspapers in central and west London. And we had mutual acquaintances and I met him at our mutual friend Joe's party. I've met him twice. Um, that was the first time. The second time was on uh, Good Morning Britain when he was a host. And the debate was about whether men could um, effectively pretend to be women and pose as mothers for stage plays, which, of course, I argued against. No, they absolutely could not. Anyway, um, so let me let's have a look at to Piers Morgan and what makes him absolutely brilliantly placed to be the perfect gatekeeper. He started off in mainstream media in 1988 at Rupert Murdoch's The Sun. By 1994, age just 29, he was appointed editor of the News of the World by Rupert Murdoch, which made Morgan the youngest editor of a British national newspaper in more than half a century. He's had a very interesting career. He's worked for most of the majors. He was also the editor of the Daily Mirror, but was fired in 2004. He published pictures depicting UK soldiers brutalizing Iraqis, but it was fake. Um, it was uh, so in the wake of the Abu Ghraib torture scandal, he was sacked as editor of the Daily Mirror with immediate effect in May 2004 uh, for refusing to apologize to the Mirror publisher for authorizing the newspaper's publications of said fake photographs. According to official sources, the staged photographs were apparently taken in northwest England and under the headline, sorry, we were hoaxed, the mirror responded that it had fallen victim to a calculated and malicious hoax and apologised for the publication of the photographs. However, Morgan refused to admit that the photographs were faked and stated that the abuse shown in the photographs was similar to the sort of abuse that was happening in the British Army in Iraq at the time. Again, uh, it, this, as you will see, is a pattern of behaviour from Piers Morgan, who is almost never prepared to admit when something may be awry. He has worked extensively for US and UK broadcasters as a television presenter. He's hosted ITV uh, talk show Piers Morgan Life Stories. He co-presented the ITV breakfast show Good Morning Britain um, from 2015 to 2021. These days, he slipped into the graveyard of broadcasting on Rupert Murdoch's perpetually awful talk TV with Piers Morgan Uncensored, which on some nights has registered only about 30,000 viewers, which is really low given how much money has been ploughed into continuing to keep 
Piers Morgan famous. Now, what we do know about Piers Morgan, unquestionably, he's very useful to the powers that be. And one of the reasons why is because as much as I may dislike him, he is a versatile interviewer. He can do political interviews and weepy human interest stories. Um, but let's look a little bit more about what went on when he was at the Daily Mirror. He was investigated in 2000 for insider trading after an article was published in the Daily Telegraph revealing that he had bought £20,000 worth of shares in the computer company Viglan just before the Mirror City Slickers column tipped Viglan as a good buy. Morgan was found by the Press Complaints Commission to have breached the Code of Conduct on financial journalism, but kept his job. The City Slicker columnists were both found to have committed further breaches of the code and were sacked before the inquiry concluded. Further inquiry by the Department of Trade and Industry in 2004 cleared Morgan of any charges. And in December 2005, the City Slicker columnists were convicted of conspiracy to breach the Financial Services Act. During the trial, it emerged that Morgan had bought £67,000 worth of Viglan shares, practically empty in his bank account, it was said, and investing under his first wife's name as well. Nothing came of that, and Piers Morgan was convicted of nothing. Um Perhaps much more concerning was him being implicated and continuing to be so in the phone hacking scandal. Morgan was editor of the Daily Mirror during the period in which the paper was implicated in the phone hacking scandal. In 2011, Morgan denied that he had ever hacked a phone and stated that he had not, in quotes, to my knowledge, published any story obtained from hacking of a phone. At the Leveson inquiry, which was the inquiry to media standards and ethics, Morgan gave testimony in which he danced around the issue of phone hacking, uh, which was really interesting because broadcaster Jeremy Clarkson also testified in which he claimed Morgan had shown him um, how phone hacking was possible in a most jovial and light-hearted way. And Chair Brian Leveson was far from impressed with Morgan. He said the comments made in Morgan's testimony about phone hacking were utterly unpersuasive and, quote, that he was aware that it was taking place in the press as a whole and that he was sufficiently unembarrassed by what was criminal behaviour that he was prepared to joke about it. Um, phone hacking, for those who are not familiar, is intercepting someone's voicemail. It's been acknowledged as a widespread practice within British media, and the fallout is still happening. Regarding the phone hacking, in 2013, Morgan was interviewed under caution by police officers investigating the allegations at Mirror Group newspapers during his time as an editor. In 2014, Trinity Mirror um, group admitted for the first time that some of its journalists had been involved in phone hacking and agreed to pay compensation to four people who sued for the alleged hacking of voicemails. Six other phone hacking claims had already been settled. Um, the BBC reported at the time that it had seen legal papers showing that although the alleged hacking could have taken place as early as 1998, the bulk of the alleged wrongdoing took place in the early 2000s when Morgan was the Daily Mirror editor. As I say, Morgan has always denied any involvement in the practice, but it's continuing. As I say, the fallout is continuing. Um, this year, Prince Harry accused Morgan of conducting horrific personal attacks and a campaign of intimidation against him, hoping that he would back down from holding him accountable. Accountable. Um, Prince Harry referred to the practice of phone hacking, including having allegedly hacked the phones of Harry and his mother, Diana, Princess of Wales, which brings us to a significant target of Morgan's rage, and that is um, Harry and Meghan, no matter what you think of them, Morgan's obsession with this pair goes way beyond journalism and into the realm of something else, which I find much more fascinating and curious. Pretty much like broadcaster Dan Wooden, who has been extensively accused of some fairly heinous things and is currently under police investigation, both Wooten and Morgan are utterly 
utterly, unreasonably, stalkerishly obsessed with Harry and Meghan. And it is way beyond journalism. So let's look at uh, what the story is with Piers Morgan and Meghan. It's a peculiar story. So basically what happened was before she had met Prince Harry, she had become Twitter friends with Piers Morgan and they chatted and he was clearly a big fan of her. Um, And then, of course, he became one of her most vocal critics. So what happened to to make him make this about turn occur? Well, basically, she ejected him. She wasn't interested in maintaining any kind of relationship with him once she'd got together with Prince Harry. And let's be clear, it wasn't like she had uh, a relationship with him in the first place. You know, she was somebody who recognized that he was more famous than her and he could help her career. So when he started following her on Twitter, she immediately sent him, uh, you know, a direct message saying that she was a fan because Megan is, you know, a recognized social climate. Nothing wrong with that. It is what it is. Um, And, um, you know, but so what happened was when she was in London, Piers Morgan took Megan out for a drink. And actually it was, that was the same night that she then left Morgan, got into a cab and went off to meet Prince Harry for the first time. And after that, she wasn't interested in Morgan. Now this could have been for a number of reasons. It could have been that meeting him made her skin crawl and she didn't want to continue any kind of relationship with him. Or it could have been that once she met Prince Harry, she realized that she didn't want to be around people like Piers Morgan, who uh, Prince Harry had already had issues with um, concerning his mother. Anyway, so um, Morgan took this all really badly. And as I say, he was uh, initially full of great praise for her. A Piers Morgan quote about Meghan was, Meghan's got beauty, brains, charm, and a great sense of humour. She's also an ambitious, hardworking, and talented actress with an impressive passion for things she believes in. And Morgan at the time, you know, this was writing in a column and he addressed Prince Harry in the column, telling him to ignore all the poisonous rubbish you're reading or hearing about her. Now, so Morgan was very keen on her to begin with until she essentially didn't want him around. And uh, she, she only met him once. And the way that he's carried on is literally like a rejected ex-lover. It's embarrassing to see a public man uh, behave in such a way. He's a married man um, behaving like some lovelorn teen um, or a jilted lover. This may be for a number of reasons. It could be because of the rejection, but it is also um, absolutely attached to the work that he does in upholding the British establishment and in particular the royals, more of which later. He also teamed up with Meghan Markle's father um, to demonise her, which to me is utterly repugnant. Honestly, I, I think it is almost immaterial what has happened between Meghan and Thomas Markle, for Thomas Markle to team up with a man who is so hell-bent on destroying Markle's daughter is absolutely reprehensible. I have no respect for Thomas Markle for doing that. You know, his hatred of Meghan Markle eventually led to him leaving Good Morning Britain in March 2021. He was criticising the Oprah Winfrey interview with Harry and Meghan and the weatherman actually it was it was actually a brilliant scene the weatherman really essentially held into account where his co-host had failed to Piers Morgan had used that huge platform to endlessly torture and stalk Meghan Markle no doubt about it it was just a point you could not call this journalism any more than what Dan Wooden does is journalism it is actually shocking what they've been allowed to get away with and the weatherman Alex Beresford essentially called him out and just said you know okay you know she wasn't interested in maintaining a friendship with you and you've gone on and on about her forever and Piers Morgan because he's so thin-skinned like All these people are. Jeremy Vine is exactly the same. But Piers Morgan was so thin skinned that he could not take being questioned or criticised on set. And he actually walked off. And that was it. He left with immediate effect. They didn't really want him back. That was the truth. He he was well past his sell by date on there. He was just he was just well too shouty and outrageous and shock jockey for first thing in the morning. 
You know, the thing is, is that one of the reasons that I know that Piers Morgan isn't a real journalist and that he is a pawn of the British establishment is I have a benchmark and it revolves around one particular story, and that is the Madeleine McCann story. And any journalist in the know, any journalist who comments on Madeleine McCann should surely have looked into the story and realised that the abduction story simply does not add up. But Piers Morgan has not only endlessly promoted the abduction story, but he has demonised those who have questioned it calling people like me, not me directly, but calling anybody who questions the Madeleine McCann abduction theory, trolls, that they are destroying Kate and Jerry McCann, et cetera, et cetera. The Madeleine McCann story, to me, absolutely exemplifies um, repeaters, not reporters. Anybody who has followed the Madeleine McCann story knows that the abduction story is extremely questionable and to follow it to the degree and promote it to the degree that Piers Morgan has, has always told me that he is not a journalist as, uh, as it says on the tin. And take it from a journalist who has made two Madeleine McCann documentaries. You don't get to interview Kate and Jerry McCann if you are going to seriously question them about the abduction theory. My biggest issue with Piers Morgan was around COVID. He was the ultimate COVID enforcer. Throughout COVID, he displayed all the traits of being a farmer representative, far more than a journalist. He was even there when the first COVID jabs were administered live on TV and when, when Matt Hancock fake cried on his show. And Piers Morgan was like, oh, you're really emotional. Yeah, yeah, he's emotional there. He's laughing. Um, he's laughing at us all. And you're failing to hold him to account. Uh, Morgan's approach to COVID was scary. It was beyond totalitarianism. There were endless appearances of him being a COVID enforcer and wanting people who ask questions to be isolated and penalised. Look at all of these videos. And there are so many more. He was utterly obsessed. This is the thing about him. He's got an obsessive personality. Once he becomes fixated on something, it's really difficult to shift him. Now, is that choice or is that what his handlers want? And the thing about Piers Morgan is he sets himself up as like holding power to account. That's absolutely ridiculous. On COVID, he was absolutely on message. You know, even the ones where he was claiming to be holding government, government ministers to account is ridiculous because they were really all singing from the same hymn sheet. And whatever the government was proposing, uh, whether that was checks at borders, vaccine passports or vaccines, Morgan wanted them to go faster and harder on people. It is incalculable how many people he may have encouraged to take a an experimental jab and almost certainly some of them are no longer around to tell the tale. He was on all of it. Masks, lockdown, isolate people from society, full throttle draconian madness from Morgan. In fact, for this alone, I will personally never forgive him. This is what I said at a recent festival where I was hosting a panel. The COVID period was an absolute failure of journalism. I mean, an absolute failure. And so when you have people like Piers Morgan and Jeremy Vine and whomever pushing that narrative, how can you trust them about anything else? And, that, and I think that's part of the problem. Journalists are supposed to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, then where do we go with that? I can't personally forgive any of them, even if Piers Morgan fell down on his knees and begged me personally for forgiveness. I'd tell him to go and do one because. <laughs> and it's really simple why, because if he leapt on COVID the way he, he did, he'll leap on the next thing that is designed to enslave us. So I can't personally afford to forgive these people. And so, and, and, and also I think that they, they've completely betrayed what journalism is anyway. You see, what annoys me is that Morgan has now realised which way the wind is blowing. So he's now doing a, a reversal of his previously held opinions on the whole issue of COVID. Follow the science, he says. No, it is not for journalists to follow the science. Not now, not ever. Right. No journalist should have accepted at face value what was being said about COVID. For starters, it didn't make sense even on a basic gut level. A journalist's job is not to follow the science, but to question the science. 
How was this science funded? Are there vested interests in the result of this science? Those are the questions that we as journalists should be asking. So it doesn't follow through that suddenly, just because the scientists are saying something different, Morgan's cop-out is, well, the science has changed. No, the science the science never changed, not the real science, right? The compromised scientists may have changed, but the real science never changed, okay? Um, and uh, there's other things that, you know, the thing, the thing about Piers Morgan, again, in this fake way that it looks like he's holding power to account, he did that um, this week with Sadiq Khan, who's obviously pushed through this horrendous expansion, uh, ULES, because Sadiq Khan is an eco-fascist and it isn't about saving lives because if it was about saving lives, you'd have all the cars removed from the streets in London. But the fact is, if you can afford to pay for some people up to £32.50 just to go from one side of London to another a day, imagine that. So if you can afford to pay, then you can drive. Well, how is that? eliminating the emissions that Sadiq Khan is claiming. Um, it's a lie, an absolute lie. And Morgan has Sadiq Khan on and uh, critics, including a mayoral candidate, um, the only one who actually is prepared to scrap all of you, Les, um, said that, you know, there was no interrogation going on here. It was it, it was really a soft interview. Sadiq Khan's dodgy stats were left unchallenged by Morgan. It was an it was a PR interview dressed up as um as a political interview, but it was nothing of the sort. Um, and the thing is, is that Piers Morgan promotes all these people that he claims that he's not. So, for example, Mizzy, you know, um, who they've called the TikTok terrorist, there's one example, Piers Morgan promoted him, right? And the other thing is, is that Piers Morgan over the years has been pictured with one dubious character after another. And I am not suggesting for a second that Piers Morgan were aware that some of these characters were nonces. Now, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that he made a choice to be pictured with all of these people, which already is fairly dodgy. I was a music journalist for almost 12 years. I never had my picture taken with artists, apart from anything else, really unprofessional. Right. But here he is. You have Piers Morgan with all manner of people, all manner of nonces, whether that was Max Clifford, the PR, Rolf Harris. Don't forget this. This, I mean, this image of him with Glenn Maxwell, which he has sought to distance himself from. He's like, you know, don't be making any allegations towards me regarding Glenn Maxwell. And I wouldn't either. It's not advisable. But it is interesting that you are pictured with so many very dodgy people, dodgy people who went on to have convictions. And as I say, obviously can't claim that he knew that any of these people were, but I just find it interesting that he's pictured with so many of them. And do anybody remember about what he said about Jimmy Savile? Jimmy Savile, of course, establishment paedophile and procurer of children for the British establishment. In 2012, following the Jimmy Savile um, revelations, Morgan said he had never met Savile in his lifetime, which absolutely contradicted what he had previously written in the Mail on Sunday's Night and Day magazine in 2009, where he wrote, as I left, Jimmy Savile came up to me. Your TV shows are brilliant, he exclaimed. I've always loved Jimmy Savile. How convenient that... You loved Jimmy Savile before everybody knew what he was, but you you never even met him once everybody knew what he was. Um, and uh, I just find this really interesting. As I say, Piers Morgan is excellent at distancing himself from trouble, whether that is allegations of phone hacking, uh, allegations of staging photographs, or allegations of having met Jimmy Savile, whichever way it is. But the fact is, Right. It's important to understand you do not get to the position that Piers Morgan has unless you are someone who is prepared to behave like a good little handled journalist. Right. 
currently being handled by Rupert Murdoch, who frankly hates much of the world. He's handled Morgan on and off for years with his hate and division. It's interesting that Morgan was booed at the NTA Awards this week because the, the truth is Morgan is not popular with either his peers or the general public. And you have to wonder why he remains in place on such huge platforms. Could it be because he knows where the bodies are hidden? I've personally refused to be on Piers Morgan's show. One of the uh, texts I received asked me to be on his show and I said I'd rather eat my own head. And the response came back saying this is, this is exactly the kind of attitude we like. Um, you know, you know, come go for it. You could be really make really great TV. You and Piers together. I was like, no, thank you. Not going to happen. Because after his behavior around COVID, I believe that anybody who goes on his show is compromised because it, his behavior around COVID was utterly reprehensible. My response couldn't begin to beat Sinead O'Connor's response when asked to appear on his show. And she said, I'm going to quote some of this, uh, what I can safely for YouTube. Hi, Piers. I think it's best I don't do your show because of the irresistible temptation I would have to point out that you're dying to be deep in Meghan Markle. So bad it's driven you crazy and that your dislike of Prince Harry is down to him being deep in her 10 times a day. It being the case that if you were ever to get near her, which would never happen, you'd last 10 seconds. And that would be that for 10 days. Sincerely, Sinead O'Connor. Rest in peace, Sinead O'Connor. She always had the number of people like Piers Morgan. And, uh, uh, you know, as I say, this is a man who jumps on bandwagons. He jumped on the whole woke thing. You know, he's like his whole shtick these days is about woke, how things are woke. Um, America tired of him. He was a divisive character there. Um, an outsider coming in and attempting to change their Second Amendment rights to bear arms. He went after the one thing that Americans hold dear, their guns. And what nerve to think you can go into somebody else's country and mess around with their constitution. Was it guts, ignorance, cheek or something else? I think it might have been a combination of all of them. But one thing I know for certain is that Piers Morgan has handlers, right? Anybody in anybody who gets to Piers Morgan's status um, is fulfilling a number of agendas for different people, right? But the, the reality is, is that I, I think the real nub of, of Piers Morgan's gatekeeping is obviously around a number of subjects where he fulfills the criteria nicely for his uh, handlers at any given moment in time. But I believe the one area where Piers Morgan unquestionably is a gatekeeper is for the British establishment and propping up the royal family. Hence his huge attacks, significant, substantial attacks on Harry and Meghan. Morgan's support of the royal institution is beyond question. He loves what they represent. He has spent a significant period of time creating division between Charles and his younger son, Harry. Um, and you have to ask, what business is it of yours? He's constantly telling Charles in, you know, in in the press, you should do this and you should do that with Harry. No, Harry, none of your business. Piers Morgan, go and sort out your own family, mate, right? None of your business. Um, and what was interesting is that Piers Morgan has made some very interesting, stunning revelations, in fact, after he was extremely critical of the Oprah Winfrey interview with Harry and Meghan, he claimed that people reached out to him from the royal family after he raged about the interview. During an interview with Extra TV Canada, Piers Morgan said, I've had some messages communicated to me on behalf of several members of the royal family. They've been very grateful that the Extra host said, upper level people. Piers Morgan responded, well, I'm not going to go into who it was, but what I would say is gratitude that somebody was standing up. Is he kidding? The entire Western mainstream press was standing up and demonizing Harry and Meghan for that particular interview. Again, he's trying to set himself up as, you know, somebody who's out there, a lone ranger fighting 
against injustice when he's none of the sort. Morgan makes himself sound like a warrior, a soldier protecting the honour of who? The most powerful royal family in the world? That's who. Hardly on the side of everyone else, hey? This week, he wrote a column crying over the loss of the Queen. And he followed that in the evening with his talk TV show on the same night, pondering if the royal popularity was waning. Intelligent people no longer care. And some might say if he's asking those questions that he's hardly a royal supporter. Not really. Perhaps he's asking those questions to appear as if he has a semblance of balance in his royal de devotion. But it's a ruse. It's fake. It's all fake. Absolutely fake. And one of the comments that he'd said was that losing the queen was like losing a member of your own family. Well, I can tell you, as someone who has lost two of her siblings over the last three years, losing the queen was absolutely nothing like losing my siblings. Maybe Morgan doesn't get on with his family. Maybe they loathe him like the rest of the nation does. And so maybe he feels that somebody who he doesn't know um, is so important to him. But the fact is, is that he upholds the queen she is the queen bee to him even in death the fact is morgan is of fantastic and important assistant to the royal family and various members of them one of the regular guests he has on the show is lady victoria harvey she wants uh, prince andrew um cleared of the allegations uh, regarding the photograph and virginia gouffre and morgan promotes this woman I think there are absolutely issues around that photograph, but I don't want Ghislaine Maxwell freed and uh, and I don't want Prince Andrew treated as if he's just had a bit of a rough time from a lot of bad people, which is very much the impression that Morgan is allowing to be portrayed about him. And this, I believe, is Morgan's ultimate point. It is to uphold the British establishment. And for that, he is paid handsomely by a foreign man who also benefits from the British establishment being in his hands and for the gold coins that he gives them. Piers Morgan is not a journalist. He is a gatekeeper for the British establishment and should be acknowledged such. One day, he will have to stop running. He cannot keep denying the allegations that have surrounded him for decades, because after all, he should be held to account in exactly the same way that Piers Morgan believes other people should be held to account. Or is it one rule for him as a royal upholder and one rule for everybody else?